Um, as we said, I'm Marianne Cullinan. And I'm Jennifer Genova. And we are teachers um, in the classroom at this time. And we are here to talk about how we turn all of the wonderful things that happen in our, our very geek friendly circles and put them into practice for, uh, shall we say, lay people, those outside of geek friendly circles. So we are from the United States. We're from New Hampshire, where if you looked at the United States and Florida is like the, well, we'll say foot. <laughs> we'll say foot. Um, and then up on the top, Maine, and that's the head, we're the neck. And we, um, as New Englanders, have a um, compulsive need to be useful all of the time. And so we love everything that we've learned here at this conference, but we really feel very strongly that we need to put it into actionable terms that people who are not us can do with actual children. Yes. So, so basically, like, I'm going to hold up to this. Yeah, that's fine. So, as a lot of us have sort of noticed in the world with a certain show becoming incredibly popular on Netflix with young people, uh, Stranger Things, RPGs have had a bit of a renaissance. If you've uh, been hanging out with any one of the middle school or high school age group, it has all of a sudden become the thing that the cool kids are doing by choice. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, and we're also seeing that, of course, since the pandemic, an increased need for different kinds of education, social, emotional education, executive functioning, skill development um, in our classrooms. Uh, we have decided to marry those two things together and think about all of the wonderful things that RPGs can do that have a foothold in the therapeutic sphere and see how we can bring those into our classrooms. For role-playing games to ever have traction as pedagogy in the classroom, at least in the United States, it sounds really cool that other places they do edu LARPs and stuff, but that's not how it is for us. Um, there has to be a curriculum forward and a skills forward focus for teachers, and especially for teachers who aren't people who have grown up doing role-playing games or video games. So... What we are hoping to provide is a path forward, a methodology that teachers can use to uh, identify games for use in the classroom, to adapt existing games for use in the classroom, and cross our fingers, let's hope, design their own games for use in their specific classroom. This started with a project where we um, were going, we were on a uh, Zoom and a stream with a lot of our friends in the therapeutic sphere, talking about different game systems and their applicability. And it became very clear to us very early that we were on like step 15 and we needed to back way back and find step one. The question we started with is how can we find a game that's gonna help us teach kids stuff? And then we realized teach and stuff we're way too broad. And so we had to say, well, what is teach? What, what are we, what are the skills we're trying to teach? If we all talk about Dungeons and Dragons, right? There are things that it does very well and things that it does very poorly. And so if I'm trying to teach collaboration and creative thinking, I might not choose Dungeons and Dragons because it's very violence forward in terms of, you know, that, and there's like misogyny and there's a lot of problems with it. So so we st started to say, well, what are other kinds of systems and what are other kinds of learnings? And so if you take a look here at our flow chart, we, we have seen games in um, three different ways, right? Um, yesterday, Josephine was talking about leisure games. We called it recreational. They're for fun. Um, in the United States and I think across the world, there's been an increase of um, role-playing games for therapy, uh, social skills, and getting therapeutic uses. These are skill sets that we are not going to talk about because they're sort of beyond the scope of what we're doing. So we took a look at educational skill sets that you might want to teach on any given day and broke them down into these three categories. These categories obviously are quite broad. And what we have listed here as the main skills components are obviously not the only skills that one could ever seek in their classroom. But we had to balance the desire to be very specific and also the fact that we can't make a slide that has negative six point font with 4 million words on it. So we broke them into three very broad categories that uh, include, but are not limited to, for example, social emotional skills, 
flexibility, frustration, tolerance, communication, and collaboration. If any of you have ever worked with middle school age children, this is, this is a big for them. Uh, executive functioning skills. If any of you have ever met me, this is very big for me. Uh, sequencing. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rich, for getting us here on time and making us leave the cathedral. Yes. Uh, sequencing, time management, and materials management, and academic skills, which is often what we think of when we think of school. Um, content specific knowledge. So if you are learning about uh, biomes and science, or you're learning about uh, the Renaissance, literacy, oral expression, written expression, research, numeracy, and problem solving. So those are all the things you might be teaching in any given day, or probably are teaching all of them. Uh, so how can we get games to help us with those? So the next thing we looked at, we looked at the definition of what role-playing games are through a, a lot of different other authors and researchers. And we came up with, there's really three different categories of pieces of role-playing games, right? There's the structural elements, which are the rules as written. Uh, for this, the purpose of this, we're trying to use the rules as written because if I use Dungeons and Dragons, but I change all of the rules, it's not actually Dungeons and Dragons anymore. I'm just calling it that so people will come. Um, the functional elements are the actual experience and course of play during gameplay time. And then the material elements are both the required physical things like dice and cards or whatever, and the cognitive pieces that kids have to have, which might be that turn taking or an understanding of how a character sheet works or basic content knowledge or how to put a paragraph together or whatever else they have to have to, to do it. So these three different elements can be used on purpose to forward the teaching goals of any of the things that you saw in the last slide. When we sort of had these two pieces, we had this three pieces of a role-playing game and also the skills categories. It, you know, if you've, in teaching, we love a rubric. We are big rubric fans. I never met a box chart I didn't like. Uh, we had across the top and down the bottom and, or down the side rather. And what we found was that we were mapping elements of games to specific skill outcomes. Uh, we'll, we'll explain further on the next slide. And this is a way to bridge the gap between those of us who love and grew up with games and sort of have that schema already built, that shared vocabulary, and people who may be coming from a purely educational side and are looking in at all of the fun that we're hab having and wondering like how they can get in and bring that into their classroom. Well, and the reality is in an educational setting, having fun isn't enough. It's really important and incredibly engaging and it makes people want to learn, but it has to be focused on the learning that you need to have done. It can't just be accidental. Right. There is a lot of incidental, that non-formal learning, but there needs to be purposeful learning. And so this is a very busy. This is a piece of our matrix, but it's a very familiar format for teachers. The first thing um, on the top is the context. We didn't include context in this matrix as part of the decision making because as a teacher, you don't get to choose who you have, how long you have them or what you teach most of the time. But you do need to take those things under consideration because if you have a second grader, it's gonna look a lot different than a German class of 12th graders. Uh, so if we see up here, we do have a lot of things for teachers to consider. We have to know our students and we have to know where they are. Uh, but furthering into the actual skills, if you look, for example, collaboration, which is something that we are seeing our students need a lot. If you are trying to design a game that will push your students to work on their collaboration skills, you may look for rules that specifically requires working together. You may look for something that is low combat because that tends to uh, inspire contention, uh, who can do the most damage or the most healing. Um, and collaborative world building opportunities. If you are looking for, for a material element, you may look for resources that must be shared. Maybe everyone has um, a set of scrolls that they have to pass around and every, not there isn't one set for every person we have to work together. 
uh, you may look for something that has very clear proscripted safety tools that are built into the system. Um, and for contextual considerations, we have to think about things like the social power in the class. We have to think about things like the norms and expectations of the classroom, which will determine a lot of the norms and expectations of the game table. And how does that support collaboration? And whether or not the students have the expressive and receptive vocabulary to engage in this kind of group work. There may be a lot more, and this will illuminate for teachers where the pre-teaching may have to happen, where the debrief may have to happen, and what may be the stopping points mid-game, where I mean, we may need to stop and clarify some things as the class is progressing. And when we originally did this, we did this so that teachers could look at published RPGs and say, is this something that I can use in my classroom? Are there elements of this that I can use in my classroom? But we also think that this is the beginning of being able to make your own role-playing game, right? Because then you can look at, all right, this particular group of children has a really hard time with reading comprehension and time management. How can I craft activities uh, role-playing activities within a game setting that are going to challenge them and give them practice in both of those things. So this is our new idea. So uh, this matrix is something that we want to put into practice uh, ourselves and with some of our colleagues. Um, this is something that, this is draft one. And so as we use it, certainly we will get feedback and make some adjustments. I'm sure there are things we didn't think of and maybe things that we've put in there that are not as important. Uh, but this is the beginning of this conversation of how to sort of educationalize um, role-playing games in a way that's going to invite the people who aren't already in this room or on Zoom in and allow them access to our little geek world. And something that's really important is that this cannot be exhaustive because there are always wonderful things that happen at the game table that you cannot plan for. Um, you know, you, you can't, we can't uh, determine every single possible outcome at the start of a class. And that's not the point of this. The point of this is to give teachers a roadmap for beginning to incorporate more role-playing games into their classrooms. Yes. And that's it. I realized, actually, I lied, that's not it. I realized that it's almost it, um, that we um, have a pretty extensive, oh, that's okay. We have a pretty extensive um, resources list and source list that we didn't put onto this slideshow, but we have and we're happy to share it and it's in our article. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's really it. <laughs>